The intent of the bill that I introduced is to um, strengthen the state protection, the Vermont state protection through the Vermont water quality standards um, in relation to wetlands. Existing, um, in, in when I'm talking about the clean, the Federal Clean Water Act 401 certification process, that process does not include substantial protections to wetlands, um, including um, any requirement that alternatives um, to a proposed project, a development project, be considered. They do require an al uh, alternative review, um, but uh, the state does provide exemptions um, if the project is using best management practices for storm water. And using though that exemption language, um, nearly all or nearly all um, are approved. So the actual analysis of alternatives um, in relation to the impact to wetlands um, doesn't happen. So without amending the statute and the Vermont Water Quality Standards as this bill proposes, um, there would be no substantial in-state environmental review of, um, in particular, of interstate projects where development would cross state lines and impact wet wetlands that way. Um, and federal law says that the only way, way that states can do in-state review is through Section 401 of um, the certification process of the Clean Water Act. So in, in actuality, the federal law and Vermont water quality rules um, reveal that wetlands are not covered by Vermont 401 process, only surface waters. And the state of Vermont has never denied a 401 permit um, for proposed development of a wetland. So do you want to go through the, the bill or ask questions now? Do you, um, members have questions? Representative Gordon's now. Uh, do you want to walk through the bill, or does someone else with you want to walk through the bill? How about one of the, Jim, do you want to? Sure. Maybe I can give what I see as the big picture issue here. And it's state sovereignty. Can you speak up? And, and for the record, sure. say your yeah, name. This is uh, Jim Dumont speaking. Um, this is Jim Dumont speaking. I, I think the big picture issue is state sovereignty and whether Vermont can control its own future. And I say that because I'm talking about interstate gas pipeline projects in particular. The courts around the country have held that there is complete and total preemption over state regulation of interstate gas pipelines. The state has zero say whatsoever, with one exception. The one exception is what Representative Cordes has been talking about, it's clean water, it's water quality certification under the Federal Clean Water Act, alternatively known as Section 401 approval or water quality certification. Because it's right in the Federal Clean Water Act, it's not preempted. It's part of federal law. And on this basis, both the state of New York and the state of Connecticut have required examination of alternatives when going crossing brooks, streams, and in particular when filling wetlands when reviewing interstate gas pipelines that were proposed for Connecticut and New York. And their exercise of that authority was squarely upheld by the federal courts. But for those states' 401 water quality certification regulations, those gas pipelines would be traversing those states right now. Vermont does not stand in the same position as Connecticut and New York because, as Representative Cordes says, said, on their face, our water quality certification Regulations do use the term surface waters, and generally wetlands are not known for their surface waters. And um, it, you could argue it either way. I'm not saying it's clear cut. You could argue it either way, but we don't want to be in a situation where a massive, you know, a huge interstate gas pipeline company with a huge out of state law firm can litigate this to death, and um, it better to, to know for sure that the state actually has regulations in place so they can require examination of alternatives, as New York did and Connecticut did, 
and as happened in, I believe it was in Connecticut, where the applicant says, we're not going to give you information you. on alternatives. You can say no. So that's the big picture. Thank you. Jim. Are there, are there projects on the horizon right now where proposers um, of this kind of infrastructure have a vested interest already? No, there are no applications pending. Thank you. That's a good thing. Can I, can I just add a couple of clarifying points? So I want to be really clear you, about for the record, just um, John Grobman for the NRC. So the practice has been in um, the state to um, in applying the water quality standards to uh, address wetlands. So I just want to be clear about that. So the you know currently the way the Agency of Natural Resources has administered the water quality standards to 401 water quality certification projects. And just to kind of take it like one step a little bit backwards, so you need a 401 if there's a federal license that, uh, so these are big projects, right? It's a project that needs a federal license, and if you need a federal license, then you need, then this Section 401 of the Clean Water Act requirement for this water quality certification or permit kicks in. Often it's a FERC licenses, so hydroelectric projects get these 401 uh, certifications. Vermont Yankee was needed a license. They needed, you know, uh, that sort of certification. If you need an Army Corps of Engineers permit, that triggers. So they're very big projects. So just, just to kind of create some context for this. But, and when the agency historically has applied its 401 authority, it has looked at wetlands. I think what this bill is trying to do is, as Jim said, just clear up any ambiguity because we've seen litigation in other states where this issue has been raised. If water quality standards are written in a way uh, that, you know, it opens a door for an argument. But I, I want to just be clear that um, kind of what the practice has been for you know, the Clean Water Act has been in existence since 1970, so it's been a long time that it's been applied in one way. And then the other part of it there's, is the alternative analysis, which, as Jim said, really borrows from what New York and Connecticut and some other states have done. Because if you don't have that requirement in the 401, you can't go beyond what's minimum the minimum required to meet water quality standards, but looking, are there alternatives to a project that would have less of an impact, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what some states have, which we, which we don't. That's right. So we won't, right. this bill would insert that requirement into the 401 process. Right. So you, even if there is no question about whether the regulations apply, which is what John's been talking about, because you could argue it both ways, and the state has been applying it, if once you get through that hoop, or over that hoop, <coughs> you still have the question of whether alternatives analysis is required. And looking at alternatives to see if if there are alternatives with less impact in the environment is really at the heart of environmental review. And right now the existing regs say we only could do that when we're looking at the highest quality water. I forget the exact term, but um, in general it doesn't happen. Uh, the proposed changes by the federal administration regarding the waters of the U.S., do they have any impact on this, this issue? Um, you know, Vermont's definition of waters is broader than the federal definition. And it's not good, right? I mean, it's going to create legal argument opportunities, I mean, to degree. I mean, it's not, it's a, it's a very negative step. And um, I think we have good arguments under state law that our definition is clear and, and broad enough that, you know, we could be more stringent than the federal government on this. So, but. Yeah, I'm sure it'll, it could open the door to somebody coming in trying to make an argument if that rule, you know, is upheld and remains in effect. The, the Trump administration last spring indicated that it, it's aware of the tremendous power that Section 401 certification gives each of the 50 states, and they announced they're going to try and cut it back. But they can't do that without changing the Clean Water Act, which would have to go through Congress. So the Trump administration has recognized the power that states potentially have if they have good water quality certification regulations and then can use them under the Section 401. So I have to rewind. Maybe it's just so I missed, I might have missed it, but I'm hearing that our current 401 process doesn't consider wetlands, but that it does. And so can you help me? Well, what I was trying to say is that in practice, it does. The so agency has interpreted as Jim was saying, you know, the word surface waters are used in the standards. It doesn't say wetlands. Yeah. Surface waters have been interpreted 
and there hasn't been a legal challenge to include wetlands. But what Jim has identified is this potential, an argument that somebody could make, that no one has made that argument to date, but it's an argument that I'll say there's a, a, a company that wants to put in a large pipeline and they have a lot of legal resources, they could push that argument. It has not been made, it hasn't gone to court, there's no precedent on it. The practice of the agency is to look at wetlands when they look at the water quality standards. Because okay. that's been my experience. Yeah. And then, but uh, what you're saying is perhaps when a pipeline is proposed, the alternatives analysis would have, there's no required alternatives analysis in our current practice. That's correct. Or in the in the in the sure standards the themselves. Yeah. I go on, Jim. Um, uh, Marjorie, in her in your presentation, said, I think there is no project has been denied under 401k, or um, and and my question. Not the K. That's oh, four one k. Yeah, <laughs> it's that time of the year. Yeah, <laughs> under under the four hundred one, and and so <coughs> the, the question to anyone here is that because um, we we the state of Vermont has been um, giving. Uh, Exemptions uh, with 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 uh, to if they're using best management practices. Well, best management practices, or even um, the, the 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 name is failing me, but we can't do it here so we'll give some money to the agency mitigation mitigation yeah or has that been because of mitigation um and uh or is it because we're not really doing 401k under our delegation uh, there's a bunch of four jeez i love that k don't i um, 401 uh, well, how come we haven't what's going on you want to take? You want to go first? You know, I, that would be a fascinating study to engage in. I don't. I don't have an answer for that. Yeah. You'd have to go through hundreds of yeah. permits. And I want. So, so the four hundred ones are different. Like I'm saying, like you have hydroelectric four hundred ones yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. you know, they're mostly conditioned. The conditions could be such that um, it causes hydro operators significant concern, and that we have appeals of those sometimes because the flow restrictions are such that the hydro say, you know, you can't. We don't think it's we want to operate in that way, but there could be four. The, the wetland 401s, it is usually there's avoidance and there's minimization, there's mitigation, and yeah. and I think the gas pipeline in um, in Addison County. I mean, there was intense work done to try to address like every impact, right? Like, it was no alternatives analysis, but so the staff would basically, if the applicant could say, we're going to keep on minimizing. That's right. What the impact is, you know, we could get through to a yeah, permit yeah. requirement, and yeah. it was a lot of work and months of uh, yeah. Yeah. back and forth. But right. yeah, I just reread yeah. that permit yeah. decision this morning. Lots of mitigation measures, no discussion at all of alternatives. Yeah, yeah, because it wasn't required. So, right. so I think it's a mixed bag depending on what the 401 right. is for. Right, and 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 this is not to minimize, in my mind, or, or nor my the answer to my question, the need to get a declarative statement done here. Right. Just like in information search. Thank you. Karen. Good morning, and, and thank you for coming today. Uh, I think we can all agree that um, the value of a permitting program is to ensure that we are meeting ultimately, fundamentally, our water quality standards for Vermont. And I think the, the public is interested in that, in, interested in clean water maintaining that. So permits are a way of helping to, to, to manage uh, and address potential impacts to, and to avoid those impacts. And uh, so I, I appreciate you coming to, to identify a potential loophole um, or concern that, that um, we may be faced with sometime in the, in the future. My, my question is in regards to the language with respect to uh, no practical alternative language. Um, and wanted to know in your minds whether by including this language in here we're setting ourselves for potential abuse of that language or in your minds are you feeling 
um, comfortable that um, that having this language with um, will in fact help to provide some direction to ensure that like any permit program it will be managed appropriately with the uh, outcomes that the public seeks which is fundamentally clean water. Right. John you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, so it's a good question and it's something we thought about a lot right because we're not trying to say in the bill and we need to make sure it's drafted correctly um, that if there's no practical alternative that you could avoid meeting minimum water quality standards, which I think is part of your question. Um, so this would be sort of an overlay on you have to meet minimum water quality standards, you, you know, and the standards are complicated, as you well know, and they deal with habitat issues, physical, chemical, biological, integrity of the waters and quality of the waters. So you have to meet that in a minimum, but this would be an overlay, and this is how it's done in other states, and it's almost like the part of the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, that's basically saying, not only do you have to meet minimum water quality standards, but you have to show that there's no alternative that would have less of an effect. Even if your effect would, you know, pass muster minimally under the rules, that there's not a way to, to uh, implement the project that would avoid some of the significant impacts that these very large, and again, I'm talking really large projects, right? We're talking you need a federal license, we're talking these big pipeline projects or, um, you know, Vermont Yankee type projects, you know, th th you know, this is where the realm we're in. So in other states, we really want to mimic that what they have done and require applicant to take that additional step to analyze, really, do you need to go through 75 acres of wetland? Is there another way? Because cumulatively, you might be able to meet the minimum standards, you know, in, in each and every one acre of that wetland. But is, that's a lot, still a lot of impact, right? And is there a way to implement your project that would be an alternative that would um, meet standards and do, you know, have less than 75 acres of wetland impact? So I don't just. In, in sure, in, in this draft, we came up with a three acre threshold. So if it's, a cl if it's class three wetlands and it affects less than three acres, the standard doesn't apply. To, to John's point, this is for big projects. And the example that John and I have talked about over the last year of no practical alternative that is known nationally is under Section 4F of the National Highway Act, which people sometimes learn about when they're getting planning degrees and law degrees, and it's been on the books for decades, and it says, regardless of every other environmental standard, if you're going to use federal money for a highway project that's going to affect a park, even if it meets every other standard, you have to show there's no practical alternative. So that's John's point. It's an overlay. It's, that's the intent here. 401F. <coughs> 4F. 4F. <laughs> Not K. <laughs> um, and did uh, Ellen Tchaikovsky draft this for you? Michael O'Grady. Okay. Right. Other questions while the bill presenters are here? Carol? You meant national parks? No, actually, the Section 4F applies to all, if you're going to use federal money, oh. but it's going to have a, cause a taking of any park, whether it's a state park, a local park, or a federal park. Yeah. The famous case in the Supreme Court was the Overland Park case from Tennessee, I believe. It was a state park, a city park, I think it was a state city park. Okay. I have a question. Uh, one more question, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned that these would involve the larger projects where it would trigger this federal project. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in state engagement in projects like this. Would this help to ensure a, a greater, or at least a voice for s the state to weigh in on projects that are of the magnitude you described? Does this help to facilitate the state's way. engagement as opposed to the federal engagement? Absolutely. The state's right now, is what I'm looking for. Right now, if it's an interstate gas pipeline, the state has no cards to play. They can ask, but they have no cards to play. They have no rights. They can intervene just like I could intervene. And this is in front of FERC in Washington, which is not a very user-friendly place okay. unless you're a large company. Um, so this this would give the state the, the 401 process gives the state actual leverage. Thank you.
um, taking up H99 after the floor, taking this up the floor. Um, and tomorrow morning, we're going to take up the migratory bird bill. Um, we have until 10.30 to do that, and then we have a joint assembly for the trustee of the state college. <coughs> Trying, we're trying to schedule follow-up on the Abenaki hunting rights for Friday morning, or Friday at 1, excuse me. And um, a couple more witnesses will hear from Lewis Porter, and also um, someone from, get this right the first time, the um, Commission on Native American Affairs, which will come and testify, as well as Carol, uh, Carrie's constituent. So hopefully we can Put a wrap on that Friday afternoon. Um, other than that, I don't think I don't think we have anything else unless folks have something to share now. Jim, put a wrap on it. Does that mean vote? I mean, yes, on Friday yep. on the Abenaki Human yep. Rights. Yep. Um, and we can also be sure to ask Lewis about his perspective on the disabled fishing bill that's up. Yeah. And um, maybe I heard we're not going to join them, but that may fit somewhere else. And it's a similar topic, so we can minimize our use of the commissioner's time. Um, and then tomorrow afternoon, I'm not, I don't have a read on how long the floor might be, but we'll see if there's anything else we can follow up on in that time frame. But other than that, I don't have anything else for now, so we can recess for lunch unless Awesome. All right. All right. Awesome. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you to committee members for sending me a little more to get well. And uh, I appreciate it.